happy Valentine's Day, lawyers. So I have a very special show for you guys today. It's both an opportunity for me to share a little more about myself, but also to introduce you all to my very best friend and partner in crime, my husband, Mr. Happy Lawyer, will be joining me. So I was trying to think about what I wanted to do for Valentine's Day, and then I figured that he would be the perfect guest to share what it's like to love a big law associate. We've been together for almost 10 years now. I know, it's insane. And he's been there all through law school and all through my big law life. So he's really seen the ups and downs and the down, down, downs of it all. So I'm excited to share our story with you guys. And we'll go behind the scenes on what it's like to live the happy lawyer lifestyle and how chasing happiness has impacted my life and marriage. Let's get to the show. I am super excited to introduce you guys today to someone very special. So welcome, Mr. Happy Lawyer, to the show. Dave, I'm so excited you're here today. I'm really excited too. Hi, everyone. I've been waiting for this for a while, so I hope we have some fun tonight. As you know, I usually start the show by having my guests share a brief description of who they are. So could you say a little bit about who you are? Sure. I like to say that I'm the partner of Mrs. Happy Lawyer. I am a accidental happiness project type person, I guess. I kind of fell into a lot of these types of ideas, not directly. And I'm only sort of discovering through your project how to do them purposefully. And I love the beach and I love tacos. And I'm a proud father of two with you. Oh, good. I'm glad that's with me. (laughs) So let's jump right into it. What is it like to be married to and raising two amazing children with a big law associate? Well, I think there are a lot of obvious perks that come with being married to a lawyer as far as the quality of life and our ability to pursue our dreams and have some financial freedom and take amazing vacations. I think that from the way lawyers are stereotyped, at least, it doesn't have as much of an impact on our parenting maybe as others might think that being a lawyer does just because you so naturally fit the erratic schedule around your other priorities. So that part's, I mean, it's more what it's like to be a parent with you than it is to be a parent with an associate. And I think the biggest impact or the biggest way that it factors into my life is our its impact on our relationship because your schedule is so erratic and you can work such long hours sometimes. So, I mean, I think that people will be surprised to hear you say that there are perks, but obviously we think there are, which is why I still do it. What <laughs> would you say are the challenges? Well, I mean, especially before you really found your way into your current happiness project, I think you and we experienced a lot more of this stereotypical downs as far as, you know, the emotional and ang- anxiety like effects of unpredictable work or really hard work. And I mean, we obviously, well, everyone, Hey, we've been together since before she started law school. So we went through law school together and you know, that law school is hard. So I think those were, I would count them among both the perks and the downsides in a sense, just cause that was a really challenging first two years, especially. Yeah, I guess that's really it. I mean, the erratic schedule thing, some people might have a hard time with. It doesn't really bother me. When you say the erratic schedule thing, you have to like be, because some people aren't married, right? So they don't really know how that really impacts the other person. Because if you're living the erratic schedule, you don't necessarily know what it's like to be on the other side of that. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Okay. So I think the two biggest things are our opportunities to spend time together and the way it impacts responsibilities that we share or that we have divvied up that are like part of what we need to do to you know be successful as a partnership and a team. So to speak to the second one first, obviously we're raising kids and occasionally you have to stay at the office really late, which means that maybe without much warning, I'm you know full-time dad duty through dinner and bedtime and whatever. That was obviously a lot more true at your last job than it is here, but that's like fine. I love hanging out with my kids and obviously I can handle everything. But when it's unpredictable or if I was like hoping to get something else done, I think that that's a big impact is 
as an example of like shared responsibilities where all of a sudden for a short period of time, I have to take them all on. But going back to the first, when you're in a relationship, obviously part of the reason you are is because you want to spend time together. And that can be difficult if you're not thinking ahead and accustomed to being sort of flexible and nimble when one partner's schedule might all of a sudden mean that they have to be at the office, you know, 18 or 20 out of 24 hours for several days in a row. So one thing that we've gotten a lot better at doing is sort of scheduling time together, but then also being good at recognizing when we're in those glorious slow work periods and spending, you know, increasing the amount of time that we spend together during those, those periods. I really want to talk about that because I've been thinking about that a lot lately that one of the things that I hear from a lot of young associates or associates in general is that they expect to not be able to do anything. So they go into their day being like, well, I don't expect to be able to make my dinner plans. I don't expect to be able to see my family because then I won't be disappointed. And I think that's one of the benefits of this project, at least for me, is Instead of going to my workday assuming to end my day disappointed, I assume I am going to eat dinner with my kids, but I don't hold on so tightly to that expectation that if it doesn't happen, it ruins my day. Does that make sense? Do you think that's true? Absolutely. I think one of the great magic tricks, so to speak, of this whole mentality is that exact thing where you have like really real visualized, actualized goals and desires, like, and not just big term, but like for today, but, and totally being into those and committed to those, but then also being able to just go on with your life when they can't happen. If you've decided, you know, that a work requirement is the priority and you have to lose those plans. I struggle with that, not because of work, but in general, sometimes I have things that I want and expectations and they're not possible. You've always been really good at that. It's something that I'm getting better at. And I think it's, crucial for human beings to be happy. No, I completely agree. I appreciate you giving me credit and saying I've always been good at it because I don't know that that's true. If you recall. <laughs> that's I, true. You used to be one of the... I used to always say that if you have really low expectations, you can't be disappointed. That's true. Well, this is kind of getting a feel, but I think also there's something about you that's always been the person you are now and you had a lot of slogans and phrases that were to fit you into this other mold and i mean you know you say the thing enough times you believe it so it's not to say that you didn't feel that way sometimes but that wasn't really like your true you so to speak oh <laughs> <laughs> see guys i've been drinking the woo woo kool-aid <laughs> okay so we talked a little bit about kind of how we try to stay nimble and you know, be flexible around my schedule. And obviously you have your schedule as well. And so we're working around two schedules plus this kid schedule. So there's lots of moving pieces. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be helpful for us to talk a little bit about kind of the strategies that we use to nurture our relationship and just make sure that everything's working. Yeah, there's a lot in that question for sure. The no brainer answer that's easier said than done is communication. So I think you love calendars now we have the same planner, but we also use like physical calendars on the wall that help us sort of mark really important things that we want the other person to know about and things we want to share. And that's part of the foundation. But I think the other thing, well, I don't know if this is the other thing, but another thing that we do that's sort of the opposite of big, clearly delineated plans is that we have little set moments built into our day, whether or not we've always explicitly articulated them where we can touch base and having those touch points, you know, and if you have five a day that can happen and you hit at least three of them on average on a day, it makes it really easy to naturally and deliberately, you know, take the pulse of how everyone's feeling about themselves and each other and the relationship. So like for us, you know, every morning, we can check in once the nanny gets here, and then typically we check in around lunchtime online, chatting, and then every night before we both go to sleep, we have at least a few minutes where we check in. So even if we're both super busy, we can have 15 minutes to, to decompress. And that's on top of trying to do you know at least two meals a day together. So those little things, obviously like 15 minutes here and there adds up, but so it is a big time investment, but they're 
I don't know. It's sort of, I guess it just comes down to prioritizing, but like working priorities into your system so that you default into doing those little moments of touching base and communicating that let you make sure, like you said, make sure we're feeling okay. And then, you know, spending time together is also sort of the point. Yeah. So that's like super high level. And I think that that's exactly right. But I just want to, because I know a lot of people who want to have kids and who look down the road and they're like, how is it possible? Like, how do you have two kids and do this? So I just want to like break down what the average, not super slow, but not super busy day looks like for me. And then you can correct me if I wrong or interrupt me to let me know <laughs> what I'm missing. But so we have two little guys and typically our day, well, my day starts when the baby wakes up and he usually gets up before the toddler. And so that's between five and six usually. And we typically don't get him out of bed till six unless he's really fussy, but he'll usually just lay in there and talk to himself for 45 minutes (laughs) at a time. I don't know. It's pretty awesome. And it's the cutest thing ever. I don't get much sleep during that time because I can hear him from our room, but we also don't want to get in the habit of getting him up too early. It's amazing because he shares room with his brother, but they don't wake each other up. <laughs> yeah, not at all. So I'll get up with him at six, and then usually the toddler gets up between six and seven, and we all make breakfast starting around six forty-five. Breakfast is on the table at seven, and that's when Dave usually gets up. Um, so because I sound like a total jerk. <laughs> We have divided the week into who does and doesn't get sleep in days. And I do get twice as many plus another one as a coma <laughs> on average. He gets five and I get two. So that's pretty like when I say it out loud, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a horrible person. But it works for us. I tell myself because a coma really values that time with Hobbs because that way, sorry, getting ahead of ourselves, even if she gets home late, she knows she'll get that time with Hobbs. If he's gone to sleep before she went to bed the next morning, they'll hang out together. But it is amazing that, like, the kids come storming in at 6.55, and I, like, grumble and roll out of bed and walk out there, and everyone's, like, sitting around the table, like, Mormon Rockwell eating breakfast. <laughs> Believe me, it doesn't go that smoothly on the mornings when yeah. he gets up. I, mean, I, I have, you know, one out of my two a week usually is pretty good. Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that we do is we play to our strengths, right? Like, I am better in the morning. Yep. So it just makes more sense for me to wake up early. And Do you want to keep going through your schedule? It doesn't make sense for us to both get up when one of us needs more sleep. Yes, I am going to keep going through my schedule. <laughs> so after we eat breakfast, we get the kids dressed. Dave gets ready for work. He makes his coffee. He gets makes his lunch. He and. If we have a little bit of time, we all hang out until the nanny gets there at eight. And then Dave and I both get ready and he heads off to work. What time? Usually around a little bit. Yeah, Yeah. between 8 15 and 8 30. And then I head to work around 8 45. So that is the morning of a typical day, assuming we don't have calls, we don't have to be in early, you know, and those things always happen. But between the three of us, my husband and I and the nanny, we usually have pretty good coverage in the mornings. And then I make a habit of trying to be home for dinner. And in order to do that, I need to be out, like walking out the door at like 550. And I know for a lot of you, you're thinking that that's insane, especially for those of you in New York. <laughs> I definitely was not leaving at 550 when I was working in New York. And that's been one of the real changes here in Dallas is being able to do that. I certainly can't do it every day, but I do it more days than not with the expectation that sometimes I come home and basically jump straight online, but the baby goes to sleep pretty early. So that's really important to me. So dinner's on the table at six, the nanny leaves shortly after, and then the baby goes down at seven. So we start doing his bedtime between, you know, 6.30 and 6.45, so he can be in his bed and asleep by 7. And then we all have hangout time with the toddler until he gets starts getting ready for bed between 7.30 and 7.45. Yep. And typically Dave will be responsible for bedtime. 
And that's when I kind of do my work, get stuff done, last emails that need to get, you know, sent out and all that kind of stuff so that when he's done putting the toddler to sleep, he can do a little of his own stuff as well. And then we reconvene for our time by 9.30ish. And, you know, if all goes as planned, we are in bed or asleep by 11. I think that's right. And for those of you who can do math, that means that I typically get six to seven hours of sleep. Yeah, like 11 to 5.30. Yeah. That's correct. For those of you who do not have kids who love your sleep and are saying, I could never <laughs> live like that, like I love sleep, I also love sleep. And me too. And there are certainly weekends when I catch up on my sleep, <laughs> which means that I sleep basically all day on and off. I was thinking about that thing you said where you can catch up, but you can't save up on sleep. Correct. So I do that probably, what, once every six weeks? Yeah. And usually at least every weekend. Well, not every, but almost every weekend it is you take one super killer nap. Yeah. No, on the weekends we take lots of family naps because both the boys still take a two-hour nap in the afternoon. And so I try to, if I'm not recording podcast episodes or working, nap when they nap. Yep. So that is what our schedule looks like day to day. And as I was saying before, we really play to our strengths and try to allow each person to have their own time, but also have one-on-one time with each of the kids. So I think that's really important. And we aren't in the habit of trying to split everything 50-50, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like Dave always takes out the garbage, not because that's like <laughs> the manly thing to do or whatever. It's just that's, I don't know, that's what yep. you do. <laughs> it's just how it works out. And I'm trying to like say one that d- doesn't feel super sexist because I was going to say that I always do the laundry, but that sounds like, <laughs> really gender. You do do more of the kids' laundry by a significant margin. I don't know. I always do story time pretty much, like nine mm-hmm. times out of ten. Yeah, that's because you have evening time with the kids. That's true. Or I do bath on the weekends and you cook dinner. <laughs> <It's also gendered. laughs> Is it? Okay. Well, maybe we're more con- traditional than we think. Um, Who knows? You wash the dishes more than I do. Yeah, that's very true. And you wear those gloves. It's pretty gendered. <laughs> I mean, like ladylike. <laughs> I, I have a lady side. What can I say? No shame. Yeah. So that's kind of the day to day. That's what life looks like as a big law associate with two kids and a very supportive husband. Are there any other strategies that we should talk about that we use besides calendars and Well, I think one thing that it might stand out is it sounds like we hang out for like a max of 45 minutes a night plus a few minutes in the morning, which doesn't sound like a lot. And like we also manage to fit in like you doing this. I kind of am launching my own business. We both have like friends and we have like our own just like whatever. So one thing I think it's worth noting is we don't have television. So we pretty much watch no shows more or less the only sort of entertainment like that that we consume is one of the things I wanted to mention when that you've got listened to all these podcasts. So like we have that few minutes of overlap in the morning, which is usually when I listen to like being boss with you or if you give me a ride and that's about it, which does like that totally adds up. You know what I mean? I, someone told me the other day that the average American spends 74 hours a week of screen time outside of work. And I did the math for us and we're at like 40 to 45. Like that's because we don't have a TV, I think. So that's one thing is like prioritization. Just figure out where you're spending your time. And I don't want to get down the whole like time mapping route conversation because we've talked about that a lot. But that really helped even though we didn't do that. I found a lot of little places where I was, you know, spending 20 minutes here or there every day and just chopping that stuff and being like, it's not a priority. I have like five priorities, which is still a lot, but whatever. So that's a big one. And I think another one is the... I mean, we pretty much without fail go on a date every every other Friday. That's been something new that you've instituted. And even if we just like go out to dinner and get home at like 9 or 9.30, that like two dedicated hours to just like brain dump and like feel like your kids again and you can just talk about whatever you want together forever has been really nice for us as far as like everything, you know, talking about politics or like evolving our ideas on our own businesses or thinking about what we want to do with our lives or our relationship or whatever. So that's a big, big one is really prioritizing making a little bit of time. Agreed. So now that we've given them all of the like every detail of our, our lives. Yeah, right. Snooze. 
let's dive into kind of more of the other side of all of this. And first we should start with, let's let people know, would you call yourself a happiness believer or a happiness skeptic? I'm a believer. Definitely. I don't know if there's time for talking about asterisks, but I've had to come around to like the full on perspective that you share, which is like the deliberate science of the magic of it kind of perspective. <laughs> how science I think of. of the magic. Yeah. I think that's right. <laughs> Please go on. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to explain to other people, I tell them the thing about the different emotions of the speeches next to the water and how the molecules look. <laughs> and I have a couple other ones that are like, they sound like real science experiments with like controls and data. So there is science behind all these perspectives that basically just boil down to your perspective and the emotions you bring into your experiences and your expectations change everything from what kinds of opportunities you see to how you influence your interactions to other pe- with other people to the kinds of ideas you come up with. So the science of the magic. <laughs> Fair enough. So how would you describe the impact that my project, this project, has had on our relationship and family and life? Oh, 100% positive. Every once in a while, I'm like a curmudgeon normal human being and I don't want to be like taught something. But, you know, that's about me, not this project or you. And the rest of the time, it's like helped us communicate more clearly. It's been what feels like, I mean, I feel like it's over-dramatizing maybe how negative you were before, but it does feel sometimes like it's been a complete 180 on your like perspective and your ability to have the like type of day and have the type of experiences you want. It hasn't actually influenced your parenting that much, I don't think, because you've always been sort of this glowing <laughs> like beacon of like, you just love being a parent. And that was always the case. I literally, you could have had the worst day of your life and we just got through a huge fight and the kids would babble in the room. And you'd be like, amazing. So that part hasn't changed. But everything else, it's been a huge positive impact. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Because I think that I haven't talked much about what life was like for me before the project. And the project started pretty early on. Yeah. Because I read Gretchen Rubin's The Happiness Project when we were in Singapore. So mm-hmm. I was a first year. It was spring of my first year. So I'd only been practicing for maybe four or five months And I definitely was, I wasn't unhappy. I just wasn't happy. And I was working a lot. I was working insane amounts. Yeah. We were traveling a lot, which was super fun. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of burning the candle at both ends. Absolutely. And not finding either that fulfilling. Because a lot of it felt like checking the box. Like we were doing, I was doing all the things I was supposed to be doing, but not with a lot of intention. And then when we got back to New York, that's when I had like that really bad insomnia. And I was like, (laughs) I had like stomach ulcers. I was just a wreck. Like I was such a mess. And I don't even know. Again, I wasn't even happy. I just was this constant state of, I wasn't depressed. That's the wrong word. I didn't think you were depressed. Yeah. Like anxiety ball. And it was like wrecking my body. (laughs) And I think that's like, The first year of being a big law associate is hard. Like I'm not, I would be lying if I said it wasn't. And I'm not sure how much your perspective can change how terrible the experience is. But obviously I've also met a lot of first years at this point who seem to have really great attitudes and their years tend to go so much more smoothly than the ones who come in kind of ready to go to battle almost. Like they expect the worst. And they kind of had their head down. And I just feel bad because they tend to have really bad years. And it's going to be bad. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot. So the project really started to transform me, I think, after PAX was born. Yep. And I was on maternity leave. So I had a lot of free time to start pondering life and (laughs) like the universe. I don't even know. I don't, and watch a lot of Duck Dynasty. Yeah. I mean, that was in a high point. We didn't not watch any TV during that period of life. At that point, I was also freelance copywriting. So it was like a nonstop family party. It was amazing. And for a short while, Akuma's mom was with us too, to help out. It was pretty magical because you were like all super high on being a mom. 
and like figuring this stuff out because you knew that at some point my leave was going to end and you had to have like a plan for yourself. Yeah, completely. And it was really magical. It was so much fun. That was like, I still tell people that was, I hate to say this because now I have two kids. So it's not really fair to (laughs) to say that when the first one was more magical, but it was just so fun to have you home. And it was just the three of us for basically six months straight. Yep. It was amazing. I would have kids every year if it was going to be like that. (laughs) Unfortunately, you add children each time you have kids. There's like a mathematical issue there. So when I went back to work after the first, I went back on a flex time schedule, which was one of the really great programs that Millbank had kind of to onboard and like transition moms back into practice. And so I got to work from home basically the last three years that I was there which was such a lifesaver for me and really taught me a lot about time management and kind of gave me a lot of perspective because no matter how bad the days in the office were or how long they were, I knew that on Wednesday I'd be able to sneak in those extra snuggles and time with the kids. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I'm currently on that schedule basically working from home Wednesdays. So we talk a lot about that. And like, so today it's Wednesday, I worked from home and when the kids woke up from their nap and then when they got home from the park, I just ran downstairs and they were like, papa, and they were like all excited and tackled me and stuff. And it was tremendous. And then like, I had to go back to doing my work at my computer and they were like, are you upstairs dad? And, but that's like, I don't know. I almost didn't work from home today. I had had to switch my schedule and I was so bummed about it because it's like the high point of my week. I know. Which granted, like whatever, I should have thought about it differently maybe because I could have worked from home Friday and your perspective is what you make of it, but nonetheless. Yeah, but that's part of it. I mean, it's not that you're not supposed to ever feel sad about things or that things aren't ever going to be bad. The perspective shift is one, knowing that you get to choose how you respond to things and taking ownership of that choice and not putting any value judgment on that choice. Yeah. So if, you know, you had to go in today and you decided you were going to be grumpy about that, just being like, yep, that's the choice I'm making. (laughs) It's neither good nor bad, but acknowledging that it didn't happen to you, the grumpiness, like you chose the grumpiness. Yeah, totally. And for me personally, I don't know if this is true for everyone where the magic comes in with that is that like, as soon as you relinquish, not control, but relinquish that ownership and responsibility and like pretend that you're just riding this wave of things that happen to you and it changes the course of your day. So you have a crappy day. That's where it goes wrong. So even if I hadn't had to work from going to the office today, I would have, by the time I got, I hope would have, by the time I had gotten to the office been like, that's fine. Like I'm going to work from home Friday and I don't need to let this ruin my day. Like I, I, there are lots of great things to be happy about. Cause it's no, it sucks to have a sucky day and like, I don't know what percentage, a huge percentage of the quality of your day is what you bring to it. So I think I said this the other day, but often a bad day is just a bad five minutes that you milk all day. Mm, holler. <laughs> Again, that's not to say that there aren't genuinely bad days. There obviously are, but it's so important to really be aware of when bad things are actually happening to you versus when you're just reacting to a bad thing yeah word like woe is me i have to go into my amazing job today and still get to work from home friday exactly exactly so you can see it's really fun to live with me because you get away with a lot of (laughs) (laughs) don't worry nobody gets away with anything in this house (laughs) well i'll try and get my three-year-old on the show sometime because i'm sure he'll have a lot oh my gosh trying to have the conversation with pax like why are you choosing to be sad and then i'm like i'm such a moron (laughs) I don't think he's ready for this conversation. He, I mean, he can talk circles around me when, we, when I try to get him to talk about why he's feeling <laughs> sad. So I'll get him one day. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I just have a couple more questions for you before we wrap up for today. Do you have any advice for someone who's kind of going into a relationship with a lawyer or wants to marry a lawyer? I don't know. Anything looking back that you wish you had known? Hmm. My answer, I was thinking about as you started to ask this, was how to bag a lawyer. And my answer was going to be start dating them before they come become a lawyer. (laughs) So you can like have time to get to know each other. Because 
I mean, I know a lot of his, well, prim- primarily your female lawyer friends, but I've struggled to like have enough time to sustain a relationship like in those early stages. As far as advice I wish I had had, I think that I wasn't prepared for all of the like stuff that comes with fitting in at a law firm so that you like bring home these conversations that I'm just completely out of my depth and have no advice to give. But that's fine. Like just having been prepared more to like be clueless and just be a good listener and not try to like help and have ideas and stuff would have been a big <laughs> Okay, great. So I just told like the quintessential advice for dudes, don't try to solve problems. Like brilliant advice, Dave. But it fits specifically to this thing about how if you're not a lawyer and you don't come from the lawyer world, there's gonna be a lot of stuff where you're just like shoulders in there. I have no idea. I mean, yes, that is quintessential advice, but I don't know that every guy knows that. And I'm not even sure how many guys listen to this show, but I think that it's hard to know when somebody wants help yes. and their problem solved versus when they just want an ear and reassurance and support in the form of listening. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Again, I'm going to make a suggestion that I don't know if it is really specific to trying to marry a lawyer, but like, listen and get the time to know the person. I don't know. I'm still pretty not the greatest at knowing when you want one or the other, but I know that the default with you is to always just like be an active listener. And you'll tell me usually if you like, what do you think? Give me an idea or whatever. And so I'm not saying that that's, that's the mode for everyone, but putting in time and listening to know what the mode is, is something that every person who's trying to, you know, establish or strengthen or, you know, move to the next stage, their relationship with the lawyer should do. I think that if you can hit the right tone and do it in a loving way, it is even possible to just ask. Yeah. You can always just say, I hear what you're saying. Let me know. Do you want an answer or a solution to your problem? Or do you just need to still vent right now? And Yep, that's a great. So my last piece of advice, sorry to interrupt you, but that just really clued me in on maybe the best golden nugget (laughs) is up your communication game. Because lawyers are short on time. Lawyers are used to communicating in a very specific way. Most of them are super smart and like, you know, whatever, always, even among lawyers, I don't know, maybe they're not all you, but you're clearly the ace in the room a lot of the time. So like I really had to come to another level as far as my ability to communicate. And obviously communicating means both listening and like things you send out, the words you say to be able to like not keep up with you with this happiness project necessarily, but just, you know, maintain a healthy relationship. So yeah, that's what you need to do. Look inward, Luke. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for doing this. This was really fun. Before you go, this is the last question I always ask everybody. So I'll ask you too, since you've gotten the behind the scenes look at what this has been, I'd be interested in your thoughts. What do you think is the difference between someone who's able to find happiness in life from those who aren't? So the difference in being able to be the first person versus the second, I think is the confidence, trust, faith, and willingness to put in the time to get there. Because you see people from all walks of life, all situations that are able to find happiness. And the reverse is true as well. People that on paper seem like they have everything, they can't find happiness. Happiness is a choice. And obviously it's easy for me to say that coming from a place of great privilege, but you can look and like, there's all these, you know, anecdotal stories that abound of people that have what many would say are not great situations and they're the happiest people in the world. So clearly it's not just, you know, me saying that happiness is a choice. These are people who have chosen happiness too, despite facing significant adversity and and challenges for their entire life. Couldn't have said it better myself. I know, right? (laughs) I've been reading your notes. (laughs) So thank you, Dave. And if you guys liked hearing from Dave, let me know, and I will be sure to have him back on some of the Friday Happy Chatter episodes. But that's all I got for you guys today. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining me for the Happy Lawyer Project podcast. Please head over to my website, www.thehappylawyerproject.com for more information from today's show. While you're there, I'd love it if you'd leave me your thoughts on the show. 
You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or follow me on Instagram. If you've enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to head over to iTunes to subscribe and review the show. As you know, each rating helps more listeners find the show and helps me get awesome guests on here for you guys. If there's anyone you'd like me to have on the show, or if you'd like to be on the show, head over to my website and let me know, or send me an email at akoma, O-K-E-O-M-A, at thehappylawyerproject.com. A special thanks to everyone who's left a review, sent me an email, or reached out to me in any way. I appreciate you. Thank you again for spending this time with me. And if you would like to learn more about working in your gift and living your passion, head over to the website for a free gift. Until next time, bye. Bye.